All right. Um, hello and welcome to this month's Open Research Office. Um, so clinical recruitment will be discussed by Ashley Regling. Thank you so much for helping us out today and providing us with education on uh, clinical re recruitment at um, UB. Um, as we go throughout this session, uh, if anyone has any questions throughout, Ashley said, feel free to just voice them at any point. Uh, we do plan on having some time at the end for questions if any come up, but, you know, certainly um, throughout its conversation is welcome. Uh, so what we'll do is get started and hand everything over to Ashley. Thank you again for helping us out. No problem. Thank you, Alexis, for the introduction. Um, so as Alexis said, my name is Ashley. I'm the Clinical Recruitment Coordinator for the CTSI, and today I'll be discussing clinical recruitment. Uh, so just a bit of a, a background on me. Um, I do have a master's degree in mental health counseling, as well as um, a kind of a longish history uh, with research. Um, I started in research in my undergrad. Um, I actually started in an animal lab, and I uh, took care of rats in a circadian rhythm lab, and I quickly realized that animal involved research was just uh, not something I wanted to continue with. Um, so when I went to my master's program, I switched over to humans, and I was a research assistant um, throughout my time there. And then when I moved back to Buffalo, I actually started at the Research Institute on Addictions um, as a research assistant, first with Dr. Amy Hecklenberg, and then I joined Dr. Jen Livingston. I worked for both of them for a few years. Um, then I was in the Division of Behavioral Medicine with Dr. Leonard Epstein uh, before coming to the CTSI, and I'm about to celebrate my fifth year anniversary with the CTSI, so I've been here for a while. Um, I've been in a few different positions, so some of you may know me from my previous roles in the CTSI, um, but really excited uh, to talk about clinical recruitment today. Uh, so just an overview of what we're going to be covering. Um, first, I'm going to go through the different CTSI teams that are involved in recruitment, uh, briefly discuss recruitment planning, then I'll go over just a few of the items listed in our CTSI Recruitment Resources Toolkit. Then I'm going to offer some practical tips that are both from a professional standpoint, as well as personally from my own personal experiences being a research participant, um, and then as well as just some online resources. Um, so if you look in the chat, I did already put several of those resources in the chat, um, just links for you to look at on your own time. I just wanted to make sure everyone was able to access those. And like Alexis said, at any point, if you have any questions, please feel free to either unmute or put your questions in the chat or, or raise your hand. Um, I'm sure Alexis and Marcel will keep an eye on those for me. Thank you. Uh, so first I wanted to just briefly go over um, our CTSI team. And typically I'm the person that, that will meet with a PI or meet with a research team um, in a consultation to discuss anything related to recruitment. Um, so that might be during the planning phase. Um, it might be when a study is just starting up. Um, it might be during active recruitment, um, which typically those focus on how to meet recruitment goals, um, troubleshooting any problems. Um, but really, uh, my job is great in that I interact with a bunch of our different CTSI cores, and um, I would not be able to effectively do my job if it wasn't for all of my colleagues that are just willing to help out all the time. Um, so you might see some of these people copied on emails. I might actually refer you to meet with them individually as well, um, but I just wanted to make sure I was giving credit to my colleagues. Um, so first, um, these people might look a little familiar, is our Clinical Research Facilitation Corps that is led by Dr. Sanjay Sethi. Um, Lynn is our Clinical Research Regulatory Administrator, and then Alexis and Marcel are our Clinical Research Facilitators. And I typically work most closely with Alexis and Marcel. Um, I can't speak enough for how great they are. Um, they're so knowledgeable. Um, they answer all of my questions, which at times might be kind of out of left field. Um, and what's really great about working with them um, is that not only do they provide the answer, but also the reason behind the answer. Um, so typically a lot of times my questions will involve something related to the IRB 
or related to a protocol. Um, and they're really great at explaining, you know, why the IRB might need certain information or why they might need, um, to me, what seems like extensive information and kind of the theory behind it. Um, then we have our special populations core, which is led by Dr. Teresa Quatrin and Dr. Renee Cadbell. And Andy is our core coordinator. And the special population core really involves any person that falls into a category of a special population. Um, so some of those areas are, you know, children, um, people who are pregnant, our elder population, um, individuals who are incarcerated, and really anyone that's been historically underrepresented in research. Uh, then we have our community engagement core led by Dr. Laureen Camille Bearhalter. And Keenan and Grace are our community engagement specialists. And this core focus, focuses on exactly what it says, um, how to engage our community. Um, so not only how to, you know, form partnerships with different of our different community partners or different agencies throughout Western New York, but also how to make sure that um, our community is actually engaged in our research, that, you know, they're interested in participating. Um, so, you know, they have a lot of great connections throughout Western New York. And they also uh, manage our Buffalo Research Registry through the CTSI, which I will cover a little later as well. Um, then we have our Teen Science Corps, led by Dr. Katia Noyce, and Elizabeth is our Teen Science Specialist. Um, and what they can do, you know, let's say you have a research team that you see might not be functioning to, to the highest level that it could, or you might be sensing um, some sort of interpersonal issues happening with your research team. Um, they can meet with you and, and help you to better and more effectively um, function as a team. And then our CTSI administration team, uh, I'm sure everyone knows Dr. Tim Murphy. Um, he wears many different hats at UB, but for the purposes of this presentation, I've listed him as our CTSI director. Um, Mary Sinkavich is our Chief Operating Officer, and Aaron Bailey is our Chief Financial Officer, and Aaron O'Byrne is our Senior Research Administrator. Um, so Dr. Murphy, Mary, Aaron, and Aaron are really, um, who keeps us on track as a CTSI? So who makes sure that we are staying true to our mission, um, help us moving forward, help us to um, think of, you know, novel and new and exciting things um, to do as a CTSI. Um, Christopher Schobert is our communications director. Um, and Christopher tends to have his hands in everything. Um, he is always meeting with faculty, meeting with staff, helping to, meet, to communicate um, information about clinical research uh, to our community. He manages our translational spotlight newsletter, as well as our Buffalo research newsletter. Um, he manages our social media accounts for the CTSI as well as just helps to develop content um, kind of related to anything involving um, forward-facing information for the community. And then Mo is our quality insurance specialist, um, making sure that we are producing quality work that is consistent as well as effective. And then I also have here a special thank you to the UB IRB. Um, I tend to check in with them at least on a monthly basis, if not sometimes on a weekly basis, um, with questions as well. Um, and they always get back to me, usually in a timely fashion, so a big thank you to them. Uh, so to begin, I just wanted to go over briefly recruitment planning. And I'm actually going to start with the tip box at the bottom. Um, so what is recommended is that you reach out to me as soon as you identify the grant mechanism that you are going to be applying for. And really, it's so important to think about recruitment and an effective strategy from the beginning. So from the time that you are preparing your grant application, we want to make sure that you are setting um, realistic and attainable recruitment goals and that you have a plan for recruiting um, your population for your study. Um, so a lot of times what I'll see in grant sections is, you know, something like you know, we're planning on hanging up flyers throughout the community. And the pandemic showed us that, you know, we need to be a lot more creative than that. Um, so what I can do is I'll meet with you and we'll talk about who you want to recruit and, you know, effective ways that, that might work for, for recruiting the volunteers to your study. Um, I can actually help you draft that section for your grant, um, as well as help maybe obtain letters of support, either from the CTSI or, or facilitate your connection with one of our other cores. Um, to help, uh, you know, set the groundwork for, for a strong um, recruitment strategy from the beginning. Um, we can also assist with uh, recruitment and budget-related concerns. 
And usually at that point, I'll, I'll kind of ask those questions to either Aaron Bailey or Aaron O'Byrne. Um, and then we can identify recruitment avenues, both in the community and remotely. Um, so the remote options are, are typically involving different volunteer databases that I'll cover in a little bit. And then we can also facilitate connections um, between your study team as well as community partners. And that usually involves um, either our special populations core or our community engagement core or both. Um, so again, um, the next time you or your PI might be planning to apply for a, a grant, um, please reach out to me. I'm happy to set up a consultation. Usually they're about 30 minutes in length, um, either via Zoom or in person. Um, and then typically the rest of the correspondence is done um, via email. So it's really easy for us to work together as a team. Um, and again, make sure that, that we're starting off your grant um, with realistic goals. Um, so next I wanted to just briefly go through our recruitment resources toolkit. And if you're not familiar with the recruitment toolkit, um, it's definitely something that um, kind of is eclectic. It has a bit of information on everything in it. Um, so this is what it looks like. I did put the link in the chat for the toolkit. Um, and we have several different um, areas that it covers. Um, we recently kind of did a facelift for it. So um, I'm really excited with, with a new look for it. Um, and I'm not going to cover everything that is located in the toolkit, but I would encourage you um, to look through it on your own time. If you have any questions on it um, or want to need to discuss anything, I'm definitely happy to do that as well. Um, so the first thing I wanted to cover is publicity templates. And I cannot stress this enough that your, uh, your flyers should always be consistent with our UB brand. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the branding initiative that took place several years ago. And we really want to make sure that, that anything that is going out into the community looks like it belongs to UB. Um, so that means, that, you know, being consistent with your, your fonts that, you know, they are within the UB brand, um, the color palette, anytime you're using certain add-ins um, that, that UB has provided, you know, such as these lines that are in the presentation, um, and even the lockup. So you'll see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, I have our CTSI lockup. Um, there are very specific requirements of, of where the lockup should be uh, put on, on different publicity materials, as well as the amount of white space that is surrounding the lockup. Um, so sometimes what I'll do is, is I'll change, you know, briefly tweak color schemes or definitely usually change the font um, to make sure everything is, is consistent with the UB brand. Uh, we also have template language for email and phone scripts. But a lot of times those items need to be kind of customized based off of your study. Um, so what is more typical is that um, a study will have developed, you know, those two, you know, emails or phone scripts, and I'll work with them uh, usually to cut them down a bit in length um, to make them more digestible for, for our community members. And then also make sure that they're being written in easy understood language, plain language that everyone can understand. Um, we also have IRB recruitment protocol section template language, uh, and that usually involves our volunteer databases that I'll cover in a little bit. Um, but we do try to make it easy to use our resources through the CTSI, um, as well as make that submission, uh, usually have a modification to the IRB as easy as possible. Um, and then we can provide assistance with, you know, the actual creation of a flyer or email or phone script. So let's say you're, you're just about to start, start up your study and nothing has been developed yet. Um, I can meet with you to, you know, kind of decide what's important to, to include on your, your flyers or, or in your emails or your phone scripts um, and how to best go about developing those materials. Um, and like I said, you know, I, I tend to edit a lot of already drafted materials, which sometimes makes it easier um, on, on everyone that, you know, you kind of have your ideas out and we're just kind of tweaking them to make sure um, that, that they're really easily understood by everyone. Um, the next thing is social media. And social media is something that is becoming a huge interest for a lot of different um, areas at UB, um, a lot of different PIs and research teams um, involved in human subjects research. Um, so what the CTSI can do is provide consultations on how to build social media strategies. So typically those consultations um, involve myself as well as I tend to bring in Christopher Schobert, our communications director. 
And usually um, those types of consultations are really for studies that do not have a budget um, to pay for a vendor um, to, to put together, um, you know, a, a campaign that vendors typically put together. So I have listed down here um, that our UB endorsed social media vendor is Falgren Mortine. And um, they can assist with um, basically developing your campaign as well as, you know, buying the, the, the placement um, of your, your ad in people's news feeds, um, as well as, you know, managing it. So they'll look to see, you know, if it seems like it's not doing well on Facebook, um, they might look to put it on, on Instagram or, or another platform. Um, so again, this is our UB endorsed vendor. Um, there is a fee associated with using their services. So really, this is something that probably would have to be built into your budget initially, um, again, which is why it's important to reach out at the beginning of your grant planning phase. Um, but I believe that you can set up a, a consultation to meet with them while you're planning as well to kind of get an idea about, you know, what the budget might be and, and kind of the best strategies for that. Um, okay, so next we're going to just switch gears a bit and talk about the different volunteer databases that we have. Um, and so the first is the Participate in Research Portal. And you'll see in bold that IRB approval is required to use the Participate in Research Portal. And if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a listing of studies that are in active recruitment at UB. It's great that it's free to use. And once you start actively recruiting, um, your listing can stay up on the portal um, throughout the entire duration of your recruitment period. Um, so that all listings contain a technical study title and description, and then a plain language study title and description that I'll work with research teams to develop. Um, so typically, I, I pull information from either the, uh, the protocol or the informed consent forms or, or any materials that have been developed for a study and kind of pull out the who, what, when, where, why, and how for each study. Um, there is a, a word limit um, for, for the participating research portal. So none of the listings can be um, extremely lengthy. Uh, but again, I'll work together with the research team to develop the plain language for that, as well as for the eligibility criteria. And the eligibility criteria that is listed on the portal is usually not the extensive listing of everything that will make someone eligible or ineligible. Um, so, for example, let, let's say that you're running a, a study that's looking at, for example, anxiety or something, and, um, you know, the eligibility criteria that uh, we might put up on the portal is, you know, adults over the age of 18 um, have been diagnosed with anxiety, um, not currently in any therapy or counseling, um, you know, prescribed medication, taking prescribed medication is okay, something like that. You know, and there might be a bunch of other criteria that would make someone ineligible for the study, um, but we never want it to be overwhelming for, some, for a volunteer reading information on this. Um, so really, we kind of pull out the, the main pieces that someone um, might be able to look at and say, you know, I have anxiety, you know, I'm not in therapy right now. This might be good for me to participate in. Let me, let me call the study. Um, we also put whether or not the study uh, provides compensation but we usually do not list the actual amount of the compensation. Um, we also put the participant's age group as well as the PI and the study contact. Um, so once your study is up on the portal, volunteers can search um, for your study. They can search based off of keyword, um, compensation status. Um, they can search you know, based off of the age group um, or really just browse any, any listing that is up there. And then if someone is interested in your study, um, they'll put in their name as well as either their phone number or email address. And that will be emailed directly to the PI as well as a coordinator if there's a coordinator listed on the study. Um, and a lot of times this information might change throughout the course of your active recruitment period. So we can easily update that for you. Um, so let's say the study contact might change. Um, we can do an easy update for that. Um, or even the eligibility criteria, which is something that um, is very important that, that we keep on top of. Um, so let's say that you know, you've reached 
your quota for people that identify as male, um, we would I, update the criteria instead of, you know, adults over the age of 18 um, to people who identify as female over the age of 18, um, just to make sure that, that people know whether or not they're eligible and to, again, really make sure that we're keeping up to date on that and keeping that um, as current as possible. Um, the next database is the Buffalo Research Registry. And I briefly mentioned this earlier. Um, it was developed and is maintained by our CTSI Community Engagement Corps, and it does need IRB approval. Um, so what it is, is a database of people from Western New York who have shown an interest in becoming study volunteers. And anyone that's interested in getting involved in it um, will complete a health profile. And that health profile contains information such as their age, their race or ethnicity. Um, they can put in their medical conditions or diagnoses. However, this is not required of them to include. Um, we also have a question on if they're interested in receiving information on studies involving children. So in order to register for the, the Buffalo Research Registry, you do need to be over the age of 18. Um, but this is a way to kind of include, um, you know, that child population that parents, you know, or parents or guardians can indicate if they're interested in studies for, for individuals under the age of 18. Um, and then we do also have a question on um, alcohol and drug use on, on the registry as well. Um, so if you are interested in using the Buffalo Research Registry or you want more information on it, Usually, um, we'll have you set up a consultation with either Keenan and or Grace in our community engagement core, and they'll go through the ins and outs of using the registry. Um, so they'll provide you with a template language to include in your modification to the IRB. And, you know, they'll pull a listing of, you know, the rough estimate of people on the registry that might fit your criteria. Um, if you are interested in moving ahead on it, it will require an IRB modification. And then our community engagement team is actually the ones that will send out your information, usually via email, um, to volunteers that match your criteria. Um, so sometimes we have done in the past mailings, um, or sometimes we do have phone numbers, but um, most times it seems like the most effective way to reach out to um, volunteers has, has been via email. Um, the next item, which is similar to the research registry, but also different, is research match. Again, IRB approval is required for this. Uh, research Match was developed by Vanderbilt University. And how it's different from our Buffalo Research Registry is that it is a national registry of anyone interested in volunteering for research studies. Um, so just like with the, the Buffalo Research Registry, volunteers can complete an extensive health profile. Um, and then we can perform volunteer searches based on location. Um, so this is where it gets really exciting. So for example, um, let's say you're running a study on North Campus. You can perform a search um, for volunteers within 50 miles of UB, and with the idea that that might be the maximum distance that someone might be willing to travel to participate in your study if they had to come into your lab. Um, but then let's say that you're doing a survey study or you're doing a study that's you know, conducted remotely, you know, via Zoom or something, um, you can open up that search to anywhere in the nation, which can really help with meeting your recruitment goals, um, you know, opening up to anyone that's on that registry. Um, and then we can also perform searches based off of age as well as medical condition or diagnosis. Um, so just with the Buffalo Research Registry, IRB approval is required. Um, I am one of our research match uh, university liaisons. So what I'll do is I'll meet with you. Um, I'll provide you with the template language to put in your protocol for the IRB. And then I'll work with you to develop your, um, your contact message, which would be sent to um, all of the volunteers that meet your criteria. And although research match does allow for some creativity with your contact messages, they do also have specific requirements um, so, for example, you, if you are running a survey study, you can't actually include your survey link in the contact message, and you can't actually include, you know, the phone number or email address of anyone from your research staff. Um, it's just requirements that they have that uh, this tends to happen at, at least once a month that I'll receive a a research request through Research Match, and you know I'll go in to approve it, and you know I'll look at the protocol, and the protocol is great. It includes the appropriate language, and the approval letter is there. 
but then I'll take a look at the contact message and there's something about it that isn't compliant. And a lot of times it involves that either a survey link is included or contact information for the research staff is included. And so unfortunately, I have to deny the request and then I have to instruct the research team to submit another modification to the IRB with the compliant uh, contact message. Um, so the IRB tends to approve those requests pretty quickly, um, but it's just an added step that if we can avoid doing that, um, again, happy to meet with you ahead of time, happy to work together to develop those contact messages. So that is just one, one modification that we have to submit to the IRB. Um, last is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so clinicaltrials.gov is a global registry and results database of publicly and privately supported clinical studies involving human participants. Um, so I'm not actually the one that deals with clinicaltrials.gov. If you are interested in learning more information or um, how to go about listing your study on the site, you can submit a CTSI service request. And I believe I've linked that in the chat. Um, and I, I believe those, uh, those requests go to Lynn and or Mo within the CTSI to, to give you help on that. Um, and then, yes, we do have one more database to cover. Um, so I2B2 and Trinetics also require IRB approval. And if you're not familiar with I2B2 and Trinetics, um, it allows us to um, search the identified uh, patient data. It's free to use, which is great um, for anyone associated with our Buffalo Translational Consortium, um, which includes UB, um, several of the local hospitals, um, as well as several different agencies throughout Western New York. And at the moment, it contains over 8,000 um, patients' electronic health records. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about ITB2 and Trinetics, um, usually what we'll do is we'll have you set up an account first. And then I'll work with you to develop the appropriate paperwork um, for the IRB, which is a bit extensive. Um, it is a bit more paperwork than um, for the other databases. Um, but once you receive your IRB approval, um, then our Institute for Healthcare Informatics, or the IHI, will also review your, your, your documents from the IRB. And once they've approved that, then they'll actually provide you with the appropriate patient list of anyone that has met your search criteria. And from there, um, typically, you know, we'll have you contact the patient's doctor first um, before contacting the patient. Um, but it's a great tool to use. Um, we recently were able um, to include Kaleida's health data in that as well. So it's a really exciting um, option that if you're interested in learning more about, just let me know and, and I'm happy to, to talk more about that with you offline. Uh, and then lastly is our Trial Innovation Network, uh, which is also very exciting. It's um, for our entire um, CTSA program, and what it focuses on is multi-site trials. Um, so a lot of times we'll receive requests um, from different research teams that are conducting multi-site trials that are looking for additional sites. And um, Alexis and or Marshall will typically send out that information either to a point of contact in a department or just someone within the department that's uh, appropriate to see if there's any researchers at UB that might be interested in joining these multi-site trials. Um, but if you yourself are interested in planning a multi-site trial, um, we definitely encourage you to set up a meeting with the TIN network. Um, that consultation would be free. And really, they would go over with you, you know, what's involved with using the 10 network, as well as, you know, do they think it would be feasible for you to um, really engage other sites in your study? Um, so, again, that consultation is free, but using the 10 network is not free. Um, so, there is a fee associated with using their services, which, again, is why you would need to reach out to them when you're planning your grant just to make sure it's in uh, your budget and that you know, it, it, you're able to use it. But it is a really great tool. Um, again, if you're interested in multi-site trials, either joining one or um, starting one up. And then last part of the presentation, I just wanted to go through some practical tips. And again, these practical tips are from professionally. Um, so both my current role as well as my, my previous life as a research assistant, as well as just, you know, as a person that's interested in participating in research. Uh, so first we have um, general communication. 
And the first bullet point, I cannot stress enough, um, that flyers, emails, and phone scripts should be basic. Um, flyers should not be jam-packed full of information to the point that you look at it and you are just overwhelmed. Um, this is something that's common that, you know, research teams feel like they have to put everything on the flyer so that, you know, everyone really knows what's going on and it really showcases your study. But unfortunately, it tends to have the opposite impact. You know, someone just kind of gets overwhelmed by it and ends up not taking a close look at it. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do is, you know, I'll work with a study team to decide what do we really want to keep on here? What's really important? What's really going to showcase your study and get your message across? And then eliminating um, the other information that you probably will cover either during your screening process or during your consenting process. Same things with emails and phone scripts. We do not want these uh, to be paragraph after paragraph, which unfortunately is common. Um, I know, per, you know, professionally, I receive sometimes emails that are paragraph after paragraph. And it, for me, it's really hard to keep track of what the goal is of these emails. And, you know, I, I constantly have to keep referring to the previous paragraphs. And, you know, it can be a bit frustrating to get those types of emails. So we want to make sure that any correspondences that you're having with a research team or with a research participant um, are as basic as possible, that are easy to understand, as well as easily manageable, and that they're going to actually want to read through, and it's not going to take them, you know, 10 minutes to read through an email. Um, same thing with phone scripts. I often see phone scripts submitted to the IRB um, that are just paragraph after paragraph of someone talking at a person on the phone. And we don't want that. We want to always encourage a conversation. Um, and sometimes that can be difficult, you know, thinking about information that you do need to cover during a screening um, or even during a consenting if you're doing that over the phone. Um, it can be difficult to kind of have a conversation. So what that might look like is just, you know, building in pausing for your research team for them to kind of summarize in a sentence or two what was just discussed and asking them if they have any questions. And that way, if someone was unfortunately zoning out while you were talking, it not only, again, summarizes, you know, your main points for, for what you just discussed, but it also brings them back into the conversation with you. It brings back their focus um, for you to then move on to the next topic. Um, the next bullet point is um, always include a clear message of describing the importance of the study. And this always makes me laugh a bit because it's common for it to be left off, um, you know, for example, you know, let's say that you're doing an exercise study and, you know, you have a, your study title is, you know, exercise study for adults and you have a really catchy message, something like, do you love to exercise, you know, join our study, you'll walk and ride a bike for 30 minutes, um, three times and you'll get paid $50 and then you have your contact information and, and a way to, to get involved with the study. Um, so for me, I love to exercise, and I would initially look at that and say, great, I can get paid for working out. You know, I can make up to maybe $150 for, you know, working out, that this is great. But then the actual step between me thinking it's good to participate and then actually either scanning a QR code or sending an email or calling the research team um, I definitely have to believe in the purpose of the study, and nowhere is that telling me what the goal of the study is. All I know is that I'm, you know, it's for exercise for adults, and I can earn money. Um, so we always want to include why you're doing a study. Um, so let's say that you know the study is, um, you know, to help keep people's heart healthy or help prevent, you know, something a, a condition for potentially developing in the future. Um, that's something I could definitely get on board with. If I know that, you know, my activity might help to keep someone else healthy or might help them from developing something in the future, um, I would definitely participate. Um, so again, it's sometimes something that's commonly left off. And so that's, you know, something that I tend to hone in on and make sure that we're saying why your study is great, why it's important and why other people should believe in it. Um, next, we want to always avoid labeling people. Um, so I would ask that everyone just remove the word subject from your vocabulary 
which can be a bit difficult because we tend to refer um, to research involving humans as human subject research. Um, and I know I've already said that once in the presentation, um, but you know, we never want to refer to a person as a subject. Um, it's just a very negative way to, to, to say, you know, to refer to someone as. Um, and even in your lab meetings, you know, we want to try to remove that as well. Um, so for example, you know, instead of saying we have 10 subjects recruited, just say we have 10 people recruited or we have 10 volunteers recruited, 10 participants recruited. Um, we also want to avoid saying anything that equates a person with a condition. Um, for example, we don't want to say this study is for diabetics because, you know, you're labeling someone based off of their condition. Instead, we could say, you know, this study is recruiting people living with diabetes. Um, still saying the condition, um, but saying it in a way that is not labeling someone based on their condition. And then lastly, we always want to avoid phrases that are negative in nature. Um, so, for example, that someone suffers from something. Um, you know, we don't want to say a person suffering from diabetes. Again, someone living with diabetes. Um, and this is something that has been difficult for me to break the habit. Um, as I said earlier, I have a background in mental health counseling, and that's how I was trained to write up clinical notes, um, you know, that we would say, you know, the client is suffering from depression. Um, that was kind of like drilled into my head during my master's program. Um, so I think this is always a work in progress for everyone. And, you know, if you make a mistake, if you use it, you know, it's okay. Just try to move forward and try to be more aware of that um, in the future. Uh, next, we want to ensure that we are using culturally appropriate terms and images. Um, and I think that we've all had the experience that terms that we may have used five years ago or 10 years ago that, you know, personally that either was okay to use or I thought was okay to use um, are definitely not okay to use anymore. Um, so really doing your own research and your own education and staying on top of that, staying on top of what is appropriate to use. And, you know, let's say that you, you really don't know that it's, you know, kind of a gray area and you're not sure, uh, please reach out to us and I can put you in contact with our community engagement core, and they can actually facilitate having community members uh, review your, your publicity materials before going public with them. Um, and they'll look at them and say, you know, this is good to use, or nobody uses that term anymore, let's put this in instead, um, which is a, a great tool to use. Um, and then always making sure that we're using diverse images as well as appropriate images. Um, I once assisted a study that was recruiting people 65 and over, and she had pictures, I apologize for laughing, of, you know, college-age kids on their flyers. So really just making sure that, you know, our images are, are matching who we're recruiting, um, just so that it's all appropriate and no confusion going around. Um, next, we always want to make sure we're using at least 12-point font size or larger, um, depending on who you're recruiting. And this kind of goes back to, um, we're not trying to jam pack flyers full of information. We want them to be easy to read, easy to understand, and in font that is also easy to see. We don't want people squinting or having to, you know, bring out their reading glasses to try to see fine, you know, fine print on your flyers. Um, and then also use a style that is simple and easy to read. Um, so my presentation is in Arial font. Um, UB approved, part of the UB brand. Um, and it's just an easy, you know, it's a clean look, easy to read. I typically will switch um, fonts that studies have used to this font and, you know, just kind of say, does this look okay to you? You know, this is part of the UB brand. Um, we recommend using it. And then the last thing is just from a practical standpoint. Um, if you are on one of the campuses and having participants travel to your lab, I always encourage you to include directions on how to get to the building that you're in, as well as where to park, um, and not assuming that it's intuitive for everyone. Um, personally, I always get lost when I go to North Campus, probably because I've never actually worked on North Campus. Uh, even South Campus, I worked there for years, but I haven't been there for years. Um, so it's now confusing for me a bit. Um, and actually, my mom recently participated in a study on South Campus. 
And afterwards, she called me and said, Ashley, I spent more time looking for the building in the parking lot than it actually took me to participate. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want to have people frustrated that they can't find where you are um, or even leaving because they can't find the appropriate place to park or getting a ticket from UB from parking in the wrong spot. Um, so typically what I encourage is, you know, at the beginning, um, you know, download the map of whichever campus you're on, uh, circling the building in red that someone will be going to, putting a star on it, and then circling either the parking lot or parking lots that are appropriate for someone to park in. And then if you can have, you know, parking passes from um, UB parking, then that would be great as well. Um, just so again, someone doesn't get a ticket while participating in your study, that's never a good thing. Um, Next, uh, plain language, and I'm only going to briefly go over this because we are hoping to have a future open research office on this topic, uh, but I still thought it was important to briefly mention here just in case you're not able to come as well as in the meantime. Um, so plain language is really anything that is easily understood um, by anyone. So, you know, removing the ivory tower from it, um, this is not language that is appropriate, you know, for your department meetings. This is something that is typically either free of technical terms or has technical terms that are well described, um, as well as words and language that um, is typically easy to understand for anyone. Um, and why it's important is that it allows for information to be understood quickly and easily, and it can help to recruit more diverse volunteers. Um, so if people are able to understand what you're saying, they're more likely to be interested in it as well as want to participate. Um, so typically what we'll do is we'll use readability statistics when we're creating study materials. Um, there are online programs that you can use, but what I typically use is um, the readability statistic within Microsoft Word. Um, if you need help learning how to do that, I'm definitely able to help you with that. Um, it's a function within the spelling and grammar section, um, but we always want to aim for a fifth grade reading level or lower. And I can say that personally, it is a struggle to sometimes get your information um, down to a fifth grade level. And a lot of times um, what I develop is uh, unfortunately typically at a seventh grade reading level. Um, and that can be for, for a variety of reasons. Um, typically I use short sentences, um, no more than 20 words in length. Typically my paragraphs are, are pretty short, you know, four sentences at the max. Um, but the next item, using words with one or two syllables, um, is what can be a real struggle. Um, anything more than two syllables will drive up your reading level score. And that's usually why, personally, you know, the, the content that I develop is usually a bit over a fifth grade reading level. Um, so, you know, when I'm developing information, I always think it's important to still leave in technical terms. Um, and there's a bit of a debate on that of, of whether or not you should or not. Um, but for me, you know, my idea is that, you know, everyone should be um, afforded the opportunity to learn about different medical conditions or different medications. Um, even if they, they don't take that information to heart, I still think that we should always present the information, um, assuming that people are naturally curious and naturally want to learn. Um, so, for example, I recently worked with a study that was looking at tinnitus. Um, which is over two syllables, and I thought it was important to keep in the word tinnitus um, because, again, someone um, someone might have it and recognize it immediately, but someone might not have ever heard of it, and it's an opportunity for them to learn about it. Um, so what I did was I left in the word tinnitus, and then I put something in parentheses like, you know, hearing ringing in your ears, and that way you have the technical term, but you also have a description of it that everyone can understand. And that description is so important because, you know, someone might see your flyer and might not personally have tinnitus, but might have a friend or a family member or colleague that they know hears ringing in their ears and they might be able to pass on that information. Um, the same thing, anytime you use an acronym anywhere in life, please describe it. Please don't assume that people know what you're talking about um, because a lot of times um, an acronym might have multiple meetings or might not be familiar to anyone. So again, we're hoping to have uh, an open research office on this topic as well, so stay tuned for more information. Um, briefly, social media tips. Um, 
The first bullet point is probably the most important that all recruitment related social media posts and images require IRB approval. Um, so anytime you are posting anything on social media with the intent to recruit someone, you need to have that approved and reviewed by the IRB. Um, so it's important that we, um, let's say you don't have a budget to use a social media vendor, um, we can still meet to develop a strong social media plan. Um, so, you know, we always want to consider our audience and how to best spread information. Um, so, uh, you know, I think what's timely right now is we have the Bill's Home Opener coming up. Um, so, you know, we could look ahead of time and think, you know, putting something online about the Bills is always going to be catchy because we're in Buffalo. We all love the Bills. We're all passionate about the Bills. Um, so let's say that you're running a study that's looking at anxiety, you know, that same study from earlier. You know, we could write up a post that says, you know, is anxiety keeping you from attending the Bills game? Um, click here to learn more about our study that can help you manage your anxiety. And you might have, you know, a picture of Alan and Diggs hugging or something. And we submit that to the IRB. They approve it. And then you can post that before each Bills game. You can have people share it. Um, just something that, you know, is going to be eye catching, um, that even people that might not have anxiety might still like it because it involves the bills. Um, but one important consideration is the commenting and the sharing features. Um, so normally we'll ask that you turn those features off for any studies that's recruiting, um, for a condition, um, or a diagnosis or anything that's kind of sensitive in nature. Um, so, for example, for that anxiety study, we would ask that you turn off, you know, commenting and sharing because we wouldn't want someone to comment a person's name or share it to someone's Facebook and then, you know, have that be an invasion of their privacy. You know, we don't want anyone ever broadcasting a person's um, conditions, a person's diagnoses um, ever on Facebook. Um, so that's, again, something that the IRB will typically advise you on, which is, again, why it's so important to have that information approved by the IRB. Um, if you are in charge of managing a, a Facebook page for your lab, um, please post consistently. Um, I often see this. I follow a lot of the different labs from UB on Facebook that, you know, they'll, you know, a lab will be posting consistently, you know, let's say three times a week. And then all of a sudden they'll just stop posting. And normally it's because they're not getting a lot of traction. They're not getting a lot of likes. So they're not getting a lot of comments. Um, but the danger in that is then you're removing yourself from someone's newsfeed. You're removing yourself um, from them potentially seeing information on your lab or, or just staying current with your lab. Um, so I included three great examples for you to, to look at. One is our CTSI uh, Facebook page that is managed by Christopher Schobert, our communications director. Um, Christopher does a great job of not only sharing our CTSI content, but also content from, you know, the different health science schools, um, from the North Campus, um, from UB as a whole, Roswell information. So even if you don't personally have content that you've developed, it's okay to share information from around UB or information, you know, from um, pu other publications um, based on your, your area of interest in your lab. Um, the next one is the UB Child Health and Behavior Lab, um, which is run by Dr. Stephanie Ansman Saska. Um, they do a great job. Um, recently, they, they were celebrating their um, there's student interns um, that were, you know, moving on. Um, so just, you know, they posted a bunch on that, you know, showcasing their, their students and where they're going. And um, again, not necessarily about their research in particular, um, but still great to see um, different information coming from that lab. Um, and then the Jacobs Institute, which is right down the hall from me, um, they do a great job at, at publishing information on a regular basis. Um, both on the Jacobs Institute as well as at UB as a whole. And then the last thing I'm going to cover today um, is just tips for your research staff. Um, so this is for the mostly the PIs that are going to be doing the hiring. Um, please always communicate your roles and responsibilities and your expectations when hiring someone. Um, so the first thing is, what are your lab hours? Um, as a former research assistant, there were years that I worked atypical hours, um, which, you know, 12 to 8 p.m. or weekend hours. Um, it definitely is um, something that I expected um, because it was communicated to me during, um, during the hiring process. 
Um, and this is an issue that I've run into recently. Um, my daughter has been eligible for several studies at UB. And um, instead of actually enrolling in the studies, um, you know, we, we've heard that we're eligible and we go to schedule the appointments. And, you know, for both studies that I'm thinking of in particular, you know, they said that our, um, our hours are nine to five Monday through Friday. And, you know, it's just not feasible, you know, for, for a lot of people to make those hours work. Um, personally, I'm a working mom. Um, and it's not something that I would probably take a vacation day to participate in the study, um, nor would I be able to, to leave work in a timely fashion and go home and get um, my daughter and then, you know, somehow make it to campus in time. So it's unfortunately something that, that limits participation and can also lead to, um, you know, people not showing up. It's just not having hours that are, are feasible and, and, and kind of okay for your population. So always making sure that your staff is scheduling their hours, um, not based off of perhaps their own convenience, but on the convenience of your staff or of your, your population that will be recruited. Um, oops. Yes, Alexis. Um, there it seems that we have a question. If um, the individual who has the question can unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll unlock my video too. Hi, Hi. Ashley, thanks. Uh, this is Ash. I am currently working with Dr. Lennison in Division of Behavioral Medicine Lab. So I think you also work <laughs> here. I, I did, yes. With, with you. Uh, so I have two questions. Sure. Uh, first question is like, um, are there any fees involved if we want to collaborate with uh, you uh, in CTSI? Nope, nope. Completely nope. free. Yes. Anything involving the CTSI um, at UD okay. is free. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing is like, do we, uh, one, when we are, um, uh, like creating the IRB protocol, do we have to mention CTSI name, uh, in the recruitment or section that we will, in, you know, like, uh, be collaborating with you or we can do that later as well? Yeah. I think if you know, you know, when you're putting together your protocol, if you know that, um, even if, you know, you just put in our, our position titles, um, uh, cause sometimes there is, there has been, um, you know, changing staff uh, at the CTSI. So if you know, like, for example, that you want to uh, collaborate with the Community Engagement Corps, usually just mentioning um, that you'll be collaborating with Community Engagement Corps or that you'll be receiving um, recruitment assistance from me. Um, it's always good to include that from the beginning, if, if that is your plan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But if we, for for example, if we have an uh, already IRB approval, we can still work with you, right? Like yeah. We can. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Usually, then um, it just um, we'll have you submit a modification. Usually, if you're okay. using any sort of yeah. um, the services. Um, but again, usually we're able to kind of help you craft that and get that submitted mm -hmm. in a timely fashion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. No problem. Thanks for the question. Um, so next, um, just some, some lab considerations. You know, what happens if someone calls in sick? Um, you know, if you have multiple research staff members, you know, is someone expected um, to, to do those appointments or are they canceled? And then, especially in Buffalo, um, what happens if there's inclement weather? Um, the, the appropriate response is that you are not to expect your staff to drive in in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, we always want to put our staff uh, safety at um, at the you know the forefront of everything. So you know, making sure that they're able to always access, for example, their office phone um, via the Jabber app. Making sure they have that installed on their phone, their personal cell phone, or, or their laptops, um, so that they're able to contact participants um, should they need to cancel an appointment at the last minute. And then this. Um, what is the process for requesting vacation time? Um, this is just something that has come up, you know, with my own experiences with my colleagues throughout my time at UB that sometimes requesting vacation time um, can be a bit overwhelming and can be a bit stressful for people. Um, so really normalizing this from the beginning, making sure your staff knows that it's okay to take their vacation time and encouraging it, as well as making sure that they're requesting it um, in enough time um, for you all to plan. Um, next, we always want to review the appropriate phone and email etiquette. Um, and this is something I can meet with your staff on. Um, so for the phone, what does it mean to, you know, sound engaged and sound like you have a smile in your voice? Um, personally, one time I ended up not participating in a study um, because the, the research staff member 
sounded bored and annoyed that she was on the phone with me. And, you know, I don't even think I made it through the screening. And I just said, you know what, this is, this sounds like it's not a good fit for me. Um, and it was unfortunate because I was really interested in the study, but I was just completely turned off by, by the behavior of that research staff person. And I knew that I wouldn't want to actually be in person with someone that was either bored by me or again, seemed annoyed that I was participating in their study. Um, email etiquette, we always wanna avoid using slang. Um, we wanna encourage people to use, um, you know, in a, uh, a signature. Um, we wanna make sure that, you know, our, our correspondence is professional and that it's representing UB appropriately. And then what are your follow-up procedures? Um, so, you know, if someone leaves a message or someone sends an email, how quickly should your staff be following up so that they know this? Um, usually we say within a business day, um, unless it is the weekend or unless someone is on vacation, um, at which point we always encourage if, if you know someone is going to go on vacation and not managing your study email, to please put up an away message for that. Marcelle, I see you're unmuted. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's a question in the chat. That sure. was just saying um, that this is very helpful, and how can they schedule their RAs to be trained in this area? Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you want to just reach out to me, um, typically I'll set up um, a meeting either, you know, if the PI does want to attend, um, that's great. But a lot of times the PI is typically a bit too busy to attend. Um, so usually I'll, I'll correspond with the research team and we'll set up a time. Um, I would prefer to have those meetings in person, especially since, um, you know, we're kind of going back to normal. I shouldn't say that too loud, um, but I can also do them via Zoom. So please just, um, I'll put my emails on the, the last slide. Um, so please just reach out to me and, and I'm happy to set that up. Um, and then we want to discuss the procedure involved for difficult questions. Um, and usually this involves when your research staff might not know the answer to a question. Um, and we always want to make sure that they're not going to just blurt out something or make up something that is most likely incorrect. Um, so the way that I was always trained, again, this is probably from my counseling background, um, but my go-to answer was always as a research assistant, you know, I'm not really sure of the answer to that question, but I'll follow up with my supervisor and let you know as soon as I have an answer. And that way you're acknowledging the question, you're acknowledging that you don't know it, which is okay, no one is expected to know everything, and then you're coming up with a plan for following up. Um, and lastly, please always review lab safety. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I, I worked atypical hours when I was at RIA, and I always felt safe there, even when I stayed past 8 p.m. a lot of nights, um, because we had a security guard on staff. Um, either Ricky or Nancy were always there, um, and, you know, I would let them know I was there, and they would, of course, always make sure they watched me on the monitors to make sure I got to my car safely. Um, but, you know, not every every lab has that potential. Um, so we always want to make sure that your staff does feel safe at work. And if they don't feel safe staying late at an appointment, um, and a lot of times it's unfortunate that those appointments do have to happen, just making sure that, you know, you're requiring two staff members um, to always be in the lab, making sure that everyone has, you know, campus safety contact information, and really having a procedure in place for that. Yes, Marcelle. Um, there's another question that says, sure. do you have advice for medical students training for recruitment in clinical research? Ah, so I would say that, you know, it's probably best for me to, to meet with them um, because there's so much diverse areas involved in the medical research um, and also, you know, different backgrounds coming into medical school. Um, you know, personally, I have friends that um, went off to medical school that some of them did have a research background, whereas others were very limited. You know, it, it came up maybe in our experimental and design classes or something. Um, so that's why typically it's, you know, it's better to meet um, so we can kind of see, you know, is there that groundwork for, for research? Um, you know, has someone gone through and, you know, been a part of a research study? Um, and if not, um, that's definitely okay. Um, I would definitely approach it then in a different way to kind of explain the, the ins and outs. And um, even I know that all of the acronyms that we use that uh, we always should be describing can even be overwhelming. Um, so I definitely encourage, you know, more of an individual approach to that. Um, and I'm definitely happy, again, to, to meet with anyone that, that wants to discuss it, wants to learn more about research. Um, sometimes we, you know, there are different things that are offered through UB as well that I can 
can help link like more formal trainings, but um, a lot of times it's more of a, a conversation that we can have to kind of see um, where that area of interest is and, and you know, where our starting point is and, and then go from there. Um, then lastly, these are just two of the, I think the most important things that I discussed in the, the presentation, our CPSI Recruitment Resources Toolkit, um, that link is in the chat, as well as how to submit a CPSI service request. Um, so those service requests um, can go to anyone at the CPSI. We have them broken up the options based off of course. Um, so if you are interested in meeting with anyone, um, you can even submit, you know, a, a general request and we'll field it off to the right person. Um, here's my uh, email as well. Um, always you're, you're able to contact me too. If, if you're not really sure who it might be appropriate to meet with, um, but you would still like to set up a meeting either with me or someone else, um, both my email and my phone number are there. I'm always happy to help out. And with that, I will say that I think I am done with my presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ashley. So that concludes our session. Um, I will let you know that we'll be sending an email out to you, uh, all of you attendees. Thank you so much for coming as well.